Um, I know that uh, people in the room and, and probably uh, many people who are watching um, on the, the web um, are interested in two questions. Uh, first, uh, what are members of the public um, likely to think about the risks and benefits uh, of nanotechnology um, as they learn more um, about this novel science? Uh, and what can risk communicators do uh, to be sure that what the public believes fits uh, the best emerging science on nanotechnology risks? Um, what I'm going to do, and you can put the, the slideshow on, um, is to describe to you uh, a conceptual tool um, that I think can be used uh, to answer those two questions. Uh, the conceptual tool is the cultural cognition of risk. Um, I'm going to start by describing uh, what the cultural cognition of risk uh, is. Then I'm going to describe some experiment results um, that I think demonstrate its utility uh, in allowing us both uh, to predict and maybe to some extent manage uh, what the future of nanotechnology uh, risk perceptions are going to be. Okay. So start uh, with the concept of the cultural cognition of risk. Uh, th this is a, a, a way of thinking about risk perception that's very much inspired by the work of Mary Douglas and Aaron Woldovsky. Um, now the cultural cognition hypothesis, um, as I'm going to call it, um, says that individuals tend to form beliefs um, about the risks and benefits of putatively dangerous activities that match their cultural evaluations of those activities. Psychologically speaking, uh, it's a lot easier to believe that some form of conduct that you think is noble is also socially beneficial and some form of conduct that you think uh, is base is also socially dangerous than vice versa. Right. So uh, people who have relatively individualistic values tend to be skeptical about environmental risks because they perceive that accepting those kinds of claims would actually justify restricting markets, commerce, industry, the kinds of activities that are symbolic of an individualistic way of life. People who have relatively egalitarian values, in contrast, tend to be very receptive to claims of environmental risk. People who have relatively egalitarian values tend to believe that commerce, industry, markets, those are the roots of various kinds of social disparities. So it's congenial to them to believe that those activities are also socially dangerous and therefore should be regulated. And a series of studies have shown that people who have diverse values tend to divide along these lines on various kinds of risks, uh, nuclear power, genetically modified uh, organisms, global warming, and so forth. Okay. So the cultural cognition hypothesis as applied to nanotechnology says that we should expect to see the same kinds of divisions between people with the same kinds of cultural values on the risks and benefits of nanotechnology. In order to investigate this hypothesis, a team of researchers, uh, including myself, uh, with funding from the National Science Foundation and also the Project on Emerging Nanotechnology at the Woodrow Wilson Center, conducted a series of studies. The studies were aimed at determining how three discrete mechanisms that are associated with the cultural cognition of risk might affect the development of nanotechnology risk perceptions. Okay. The first of these mechanisms is biased assimilation and polarization. Uh, the idea here uh, is that people attend to information in a selective way that tends to reinforce their predispositions or their prior beliefs, right? So they attend to information in a biased way that reinforces th their inclinations. As a result, when you give people balanced information on a controversial topic, 
like say whether the death penalty deters murder, the, the people become more divided, right? They polarize rather than converge. Well, we wanted to investigate whether something like this would happen when people were exposed to information about nanotechnology. Right? So what we did was conduct a study of a, a large, diverse sample of 1,800 Americans. We divided them into two groups. One group didn't receive any information about nanotechnology except for this fairly spare definition that tells them nanotechnology is a technology that allows you to do things with things that are really, really, really small. The other group receives more information. Uh, I don't expect you to, to read this, but, but here you have two paragraphs of roughly the same length, the same information content, one of which sets forth some of the potential benefits of nanotechnology and the other some of the potential risks. Right? We wanted to see how people who were exposed to information would react relative to people who didn't have information about nanotechnology to see if we would get a biased assimilation and polarization effect. Right? And here is what we found. In the no information condition, people with diverse values Right, people who are relatively hierarchical or relatively egalitarian, people who are relatively individualistic or relatively communitarian, they don't have uh, different perceptions of nanotechnology risks. And that's basically what you would expect because 80% of the uh, subjects in our sample, uh, a comparable percentage to that in the American population, said they had either never heard of nanotechnology or, or knew very little about it. So we didn't see much except noise when we tried to figure out who perceives risk and who doesn't. But in the information exposed condition, people with these same values polarized. Right? So people who, who had relatively individualistic values, who, who had, who had non-egalitarian or hierarchical values, tended to see more benefit and less risk. People who had more egalitarian values and less individualistic values, we would say communitarian values, saw more risk and less benefit relative to their counterparts in the no information condition. Right, that, that was an example of biased assimilation. People in the information condition attended to information in a way that excited the kinds of predispositions, cultural predispositions that they have toward environmental risk in general. And as a result, they polarized along the, the cultural lines. Right. Second experiment. Uh, deals with what we call the cultural credibility heuristic. Uh, obviously, uh, ordinary people uh, don't tend to have enough time or enough technical training to make sense of lots of complicated risk issues. As a result, they have to trust experts. Well, the cultural credibility heuristic says that the experts that individuals are going to trust are the experts that individuals perceive as having or sharing their basic cultural worldview. Right? So with respect to nanotechnology, we should expect people either to accept information about its risk or benefits or reject it, depending on whether the, the expert who's giving that information to them seems to be somebody who shares their values or not. Here, are four culturally identifiable uh, experts. They're fictional experts. We describe them uh, as policy experts who were affiliated uh, with major universities. In a pretest, we found that subjects who looked at these pictures and also saw uh, accompanying CVs would impute to these fictional experts values that corresponded with the ones that are of interest in the cultural cognition of risk. Th these experts have diverse values, egalitarian or hierarchical, individualistic or communitarian. 